It's the How Games Make Money podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Grubb from GamesBeat.com. Joining me this week is Greg Miller from Kind of Funny. We're going to talk about making content for the web, what it was like to transition to that job, and a whole lot more. Join us. Stick around for the conversation. It's a really good one, I, I swear. Greg Miller is the co-founder and face of Kind of Funny. Kind of Funny is a group of hooligans out there on the West Coast making content for you related to games, related to movies and pop culture. But they do it for a good reason. They do it because they have a passionate community that supports them through direct funding on sites like Patreon. We're going to get into that and a whole lot more in our conversation uh, coming up real soon. First, though, I want to say thank you to everybody for listening. Just sort of still figuring this out. Like this intro... I'm still figuring out what I want to put here. I'm going to run through just a few quick things, and then we'll get to our conversation. Uh, first, if you want to reach out to me and you have uh, suggestions, if you want to complain about my voice or something, you can get to me on Jeff Grubb on Twitter. That's just J-E-F-F-G-R-U-B-B. Uh, if you want to email us, it's games plus podcast at VentureBeat.com. Really, uh, if you want to help us out, the, the biggest things you could do right now are tell your friends. And then rate the show on Apple Podcast. Go out there and just help other people discover the show. That would just be a huge boost uh, in this fir- the first couple of weeks for how games make money. Um, I feel like I could go on and on. Uh, there's a million things I want to cram into this intro, but let's not do that. Instead, let's throw to me and Greg having our conversation. It's a really good one. Uh, he touches on a lot of really important stuff uh, that, that I was really happy to find out about. And I think you will be too. So let's get to that right now. All right, and with me now, I got I have Greg with me. I'm gonna have Greg say hi to all the good people out there. Go ahead. Hello, good people. No salutations to the bad people. Yeah, no, man, we can't be salutating to the bad. We people. can't. I mean, that, we, then we're just accepting them, and we don't accept them. We do not. Uh, yeah, Greg. Yeah. So, uh, what's what's your title? What do you want to uh, What do you want to oh, call man. yourself? Uh, I think on the paper, on paper, right? I'm a, the CEO and one of the hosts of Kind of Funny, a co-founder of Kind of Funny. I'm I'm just I, I'm the I'm the loud guy at Kind of Funny. That's pretty much what it comes down to. So, yeah. So, I mean, the, the premise of the show is, is how do games make money, but uh, it's not just I'd about, love to know. Yeah, I know. I mean, I mean, for real, man, that's why I started the show. Don't tell anybody. I'm trying okay. to figure uh, you don't You don't have the answer. You're just yeah, no, talking to people who might not. have the answer. I appreciate that. Yeah, the, the other half of that is, like, how do people make money through games uh, and, and, and however that may look? So uh, that's the first question. Let's, let me just ask you, like, how does Kind of Funny make money? Man, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, the way, you know, we started and you know the way we make money and what i was you know people are always like how can we do what you do i'm like it's very simple you know work at the world's biggest uh, video game website for eight years and then just spin off on your own and do ba- basically that and just ask people to give you money uh sure. kind of money makes money through uh, you know a number of different ways right like if, if you're unfamiliar we are a youtube podcast crew you know i think you know when we left we definitely thought we were going to be youtubers and in reality we are podcasters that's what most of the people knew me as from ign so that's what we've seen all of our following really be in terms of the lion's share of numbers and so for us, monetizing that comes through a bunch of different ways. Obviously, there's YouTube with AdSense. Uh, you know, we do merch, uh, we do live events. But the big things for us are advertising and Patreon. Uh, advertising, you know, we do both in house and through an MCN. And, you know, we do ad reads and demic stuff on the podcast for Quip and, you know, Casper and Blue Apron and every other ad you've heard on a podcast. But then we'll do, you know, specifically tailored things like right now, you know, we produce the Borderlands show for 2K and I host that. And then outside of that, we have Patreon, which, if you're also not familiar with, is basically a Kickstarter that never ends. It's a, you know, subscription service, the idea, or service, the idea is Patreon of the arts so your audience comes to you gives you money on a monthly basis and that helps fund your creations how far into starting kind of funny did you realize that it was like oh podcasting is the thing not necessarily youtube or at least that's the defining feature of what no no totally we were i think struggling not struggling but we didn't understand that fully till we were totally on our own so you know i have the benefit of having eased into this uh, independent life over a, a couple of different years and then we broke out in 2015 on our own and we broke out in 2015 that was really when you know the youtube channel started going crazy with subs and it was like how much can you go and then, then we found out pretty quickly okay about about 250 that's <laughs> 250,000 uh, people on both of our channels watch content and that's where they want to get it otherwise it is everybody downloading stuff and doing stuff and 
I would say, man, it, it was probably, you know, starting in 2015 and for, you know, for reals, as the kids say. Uh, I mean, 2016, I remember having a conversation with Tim where he was talking about this. And I was like, ah, well, we only got this. And he's like, do you hold on? Do you know how much the podcasts do? And I'm like, no. And he started talking numbers. And I was like, oh, that makes so much more sense of we, you know, even now we struggle with it. I think where one of our shows is called KFAF and it's very visual. And it is like Andy and Nick doing Photoshop challenges and, you know, doing the whipped cream pie stuff and the hitting you know i don't even know what that is but you know what i mean they're hitting each other with pies and stuff it's stuff that is visual gags and so there's always this tenor in the audience in the community of like man i listen to this show and it's not a great experience but it's still how i listen to you guys so that's what i'm going to do <laughs> like i'm not going to come home and watch it unless the bit sounds really good otherwise i'll just be in the car listening to you guys do it so then like what did that change in terms of how are we building revenue Yeah, I think we were lucky enough that we knew from the jump that AdSense wasn't the solution. Like, again, I I started the YouTube channel in 2012. And over the years, that evolved into having the other co-founders with me that evolved eventually to us leaving. But there was a conversation, I remember, in one of our meetings when we were all starting to take it really seriously and starting to have that conversation of, maybe we go, maybe we leave IGN, maybe maybe that would be the reality. And Nick very clearly, because Nick's the adult at the table, was like, cool, everyone go home. And we met once a week about, about what would become kind of funny business. Everybody go home, come in next week with the number you need to live. And he's like, not the number you need to live your best life, but the, you know, to take care of your responsibilities, your bills, your rent, this, that, the other. And let's see where we're at. And so we all came back in with those numbers and put them on the table and looked at how much we were making off of AdSense. And at the time, a much different MCN that we not the people we're with now. And it was that idea of, whoof, more, okay, maybe, maybe in a year. Maybe in a year, probably two years, we'll be able to look at this and actually have the numbers to back it up to make that number where we could actually make this a reality. It was super demoralizing. But luckily, the next week, we went to VidCon. And on the way to VidCon, Tim passed me an article, and it was about Patreon getting their first round ever of like venture capital money and that they're going to be this big thing. And he's like, have you heard of this? And I was like, kind of. It's like Kickstarter, right? And he's like, yeah. And it was like, okay, we'll address it when we get back. So... To answer your question about the YouTube stuff and the AdSense and the, po- the podcast stuff, we were already using an MCN, so we were already doing the in- the in-read ads, and we were already doing the show both ways, where it was that, hey, you're getting it as an MP3, and you're getting it as a, a video on YouTube if you want. So we were already, thankfully, doing what we needed to do. We were already on that track. We already had a product that was m- marketed and monetized the right way. And so when we realized we were more podcasty, it was more, I think, comparing ourselves to podcasts than it was YouTube videos. You know, I th- but I think we were already naturally doing that. You know, for you know, when me starting this and Colin coming in, we had only known podcasting, and whereas Tim had come in very much knowing YouTube. And so there was a melding of styles. I think that it w- it was more the idea that. Well, how many ads, like, we've had this conversation so much of how many ads can you put in a podcast, right? And when you listen to Joe Rogan, right, it is 900 po- ads. <laughs> yeah. It's, so oh, it's right like, up if your content's too. there and your audience is there, they're fine with it. Yes. And it's a tough balance to strike, right? Like, so if you guys fit, found that balance? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I definitely do. I mean, our audience gets it, you know, Patreon being so core to the business and who we are and what our narrative is and our story that I think. People get it that if they – there's now a trade-off, right, of like, you know, we do three ads on – the most we'll do right now, and that's always up for change, obviously. But the most we do is three ads in a show. And there's that idea that we do them up front of like, you know, the show's brought to you by X, Y, and Z, but I'll tell you about that later. And then you know somewhere in the middle of the show, back half of the show, you're going to get those three ads, which what it, it hopefully are – no more than three minutes, right? 60 seconds a piece. But maybe we get into a joke in there. Maybe we go on a little bit. People know what that is. They understand that structure and they're fine with it. Plus, they know that there is the out that if they don't want that, if they're re- if it's really that big of a deal to you, you can go to Patreon and get the show ad free. And so I think and not, the fact and not that hear you guys options. talk about shaving balls, never. Yeah, I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> and that, why would you want to get away from that? How, no. how many conversations spun out of uh, our me undies conversations and our yeah. ball shaving stories? Okay, so then Patreon seems like the, the the big thing for you guys. Tell me, like, how does that work? Oh, like, wh- why is it structured the way it's structured? Just tell me about all of that. Sure, no problem. So, yeah, like I was saying, you know, we had that demoralizing meeting uh, back in would have been 2014. And it was, man, uh, we're not – we can't make this work. We, You know, Nick was already getting to the point where he's like, I understand that you guys have a little bit more time. I don't. I've been at IGN pretty much a decade. I need, I'm, I need to move. I'm getting restless. And so it was that, oh, man, what are we going to do? Went to VidCon. He showed me the article in the airport, Patreon. I know a little bit about it. And 
we were hosting a panel to, about our, uh, about ourselves and who we were and stuff. And we came off and we were doing like photos and autographs and stuff with people. And this group of guys walked by and did like a double take and ran over to me and like, holy shit, Greg Miller from IGN are such huge fans. And I'm like, oh man, great to meet you. Blah, blah. And I was talking to them and I looked down and one of them was wearing the Patreon logo on his shirt. And I was like, oh, you know the Patreon guys. And he goes, oh, yeah, I'm the vice president. And that, and it was like, whoa, whoa, you are Patreon. <laughs> you are the Patreon. You're guy. Mr. Patreon. Yeah, exactly. The heir to the Patreon fortune. <laughs> yeah, and, and I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, we just heard about you. And he's like, oh, man, we're moving into a new office, in S- our first office in SF next week. You guys should come by for a meeting. And so we went in there and had this meeting, me and Tim with them, and it was just kismet. Where, like, we laid out, we talked about the meeting, talked about what we do, you know, talked about the – this we had this really complicated solution back in the day of if you want to get the show ad free or early yeah ad free and early right you had to go to Bandcamp and you had to get a Bandcamp subscription or you could pay it piecemeal and all these different things and so they were like no this platform is perfect for you you can use this as your subscription model people can get early access they can support you there can be all these tiers and it was kind of like light bulb moments for us of like oh my gosh we can make this happen we can make this work. And we were still at IGN, and we decided to relaunch what was the Game Over Greggy YouTube channel as kind of funny. And without getting too inside, unless you really want to get inside about it, like the idea was I was working at IGN while I did this, but I w- on, on, on YouTube, I wouldn't do any gaming stuff. I wouldn't do any real right. current comics or movie stuff. Like we were trying to, if there was content I could make for IGN, I'd make it for IGN, was pretty much the agreement. So we launched relaunched is kind of funny we launched it uh, our first patreon we launched uh the new the name and the logo and everything the branding actually you know started acting like it was a company and then also uh, tr- uh, launched with a uh, hunter pence who w- w- was then and now is again an sf giant uh viral video about him and his the signs people brought to the game and at the end of day one the audience was giving us ten thousand dollars a month and it was that thing where we all looked at each other and were like wait a second like they're doing that knowing we have the great the dream job right knowing that we have the job many of them want knowing that they're subscribing to something that is not games like we're not <laughs> we're, we're playing this game with one of our hands behind our back right our, our our biggest hand i guess of that's what people know us for and that's what they want from us and we can't do that and that really got everybody thinking of like well what if we went out on our own and it also got ign thinking of what the hell are you doing <laughs> And you probably shouldn't be doing this. And so there was two separate conversations happening there as we headed into the fall of uh, 2014. And by the time we sat down with IGN to actually hash it out, uh, they saw it in our face. Like, you guys are gone, right? And we're like, yeah, we think we have to. Like, we think we have something here. We got to try it. And they're like, we get it. And it was off to the races. Like, both of them went nuts. The audience got it. They got the messaging. You know, I think even now... It's still obviously tons of people probably listening don't know what Patreon is, but a lot of people do. Whereas we were lucky enough to be like, I always said we were late to YouTube. I remember, you know, when I started the YouTube channel, it was right after a VidCon where I learned really what YouTube was. And I remember looking around at Phil DeFranco and I, Justine, and being like, ah, why hadn't I been doing this? Why hadn't when I right. was writing for the, yeah, writing for the, uh, the Columbia Daily Tribune for games, I should have been doing a YouTube video every day and it would have been huge and it would have been this. And Patreon's the first time where we were tip of the sword. So, you know, we were getting write-ups in the Wall Street Journal and USA Today and on CNN. Like, it was this huge thing of we suddenly became the poster child for it of, like, this is what we're talking about. These are just four normal guys who want to talk with their best friends, their audience about content, and the audience is down to support them. To your question of, you know, why did we just do this giant fundraising thing in January? We do it every January. It's our big anniversary. We come out. We do it. And it helps finance the next year because i think you know as with any of this you 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 remember growing up and watching pbs pledge drives and stuff like it's the same idea there and i do it too with my podcast where i listen to things over and over and over again until they finally are like hey by the way this month is a focus all right i've been listening for a year i need to i should help out same thing with us where you know we totally get that you know money is hard to come by and it, there's a million other things you could and should spend your money on but when you get to that year and it's like hey if you've been with us for this year you've seen us make five different morning shows just on kind of funny every week like there's something we've done here and we'd like you to pay it forward to help fund whatever we want to do and last year the pitch was you know we had this thermometer up with these world tour meet and greets that 
weren't the goal. The goal was funding the future of Kind of Funny and helping us get more capital so we could have more employees and we could get a bigger space and we could do all this different stuff. And so when we came back in January of this year, it was, hey, here's Blessing. We've hired him to be the first full-time games employee. Hey, we have a new studio. We're, you know, we're going to actually do a big old construction project on 4,800 square feet, which is five times the space we're in now. Like, It was... This year was the payoff to last year, and then it was also obviously the call for, hey, this is what we're doing, where we're going. If you believe in it and you're a part of it, like help us finance the rest of it, right? Because this is not going to be – it turns out it's not cheap to build a uh, warehouse out in San Francisco. When you ask people to come in and, and help support the Patreon, you're, a lot of times you're like, it's okay if it's just for this month. Is, is are, You guys are just trying to like reach a certain goal right now. It's not necessarily all about ongoing support. Yeah, I mean, there's no certain goal anymore. Like there, there was in the old days when we first started it. You know, Patreon very much was, and still is for many other creators. I shouldn't, I shouldn't like toss the baby out of the bath, bathwater. For us, it's not. But it, it used to be like, you know, at ten thousand dollars, we'll do this, or you'll get this show. At fifteen thousand dollars, you'll get this show, or whatever. Um, we moved away from that when we switched our mindset to it being subscription. Where it is for us, it's us copying without the back end what Rooster Teeth does with Rooster Teeth first or Giant Bomb with Giant, Giant Bomb Premium, right? Where it's like if we could and had the team and the staff and the know how and gumption to have our own in house subscription service and not cut it with anybody, we would. But Patreon allowed us and a lot, continues to allow us to, but in when it started, uh, start a company without debt. Like we've never been in debt. Like we've never had, we've been able to do this and we didn't need seed money. We didn't need a call to investors. We didn't, you know what I mean? Like all the things that get businesses in over their heads or get them upside down, we didn't have to worry about because the audience was there to support us and because we worked out of a spare bedroom for a year and a half. But like it's it's allowed us this fast track to becoming something that I never expected to uh, for us to be, let alone for us to be this quickly. You know what I mean? To be moving into this giant studio, to have a team of nine right now full time. So you you have ads, you have Patreon. Um, what else? What, what other things are bringing in money? Oh man. Um, so yeah, ads and Patreon. Those are the lion's share. Um, you know, the one-off ops that, you know, and Tim would have a better name for than me because he's the real business guy. But uh, Activations probably, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Activations, yeah, right, of me hosting, right? That's always been the big thing, I think, that, you know, we had to have a – we have many sit-downs with our audiences, obviously. But there was one where I was getting ready to go do some show or maybe I'd come back from a show, I forget, and I'd been hosting something. And, you know, I think there was a subreddit thread of just like – man, it sucks that Greg's off doing all this stuff on his own or for himself or whatever. And I had to get in there and be like very transparent of like, you need to understand that that's not how this works. Like me going to do something, Nick going to do something, whoever, like that's us leaving to make money for the company. Like I none of the, you know, when you see me host Dice Awards, it's not that I'm doing that to get a paycheck for me. And that goes in my, me and Jen go on vacation. It's like, no, that's coming back into the company to help everything grow and go. And, you know, again, that's a, a very old conversation, I would venture to say, because I think really when we started uh, Games Daily and we really started doing the game content each and every day, it's been the audience getting used to the idea that Kind of Funny is bigger than me, Tim, and Nick. It is this idea that it is this ever-expanding brand. We're going to have this whole menagerie of guests and you know coworkers and part-timers, you know what I mean, to have Imran Khan and Fran Mirabella in here every week now, Gary Witte in here every week, and then, of course, Andrea Renee and Danny O'Dwyer, the one we had him before. Like That got them used to what we were building, what we were doing, and what it was, because I understand the a shift of looking at it originally when it was just four guys in a spare bedroom or when you were looking at it, it was just my YouTube channel and it was just me talking. The shift to being a company now has been, you know, a road. It's been rocky at times, but it's to the point now that the audience gets it. And even like, you know, with Blessing coming in at the beginning of the year and, you know, being my counterpart on games that like this is his full-time job of like just paying attention to video games and doing those shows with me. That's also alleviated so much of it where, people get that they see him on a show and it's not ah shit where's greg it is oh i get it you know this is what he's doing this is his job this is what kind of funny is in 2020 and going forward do you feel like um part of helping the audience learn that or do you feel like you're teaching the audience like oh yeah we are bigger than what, what we originally were or is it that the audience is just accepting it and it just takes some time i think it's them learning with it, us as we learn it like i i we're definitely there now i'm talking about you know years ago no, at, at this point or whatever but like there was that idea of what it, I, I mean to this day 
you can on a given on any given day <laughs> go to our subreddit and if you look hard enough you'll find a thread where someone in there is like man i just miss miss when they did the content in their spare bedroom that was so much better that was so much more you know and a million reasons they think it was better and whatever and they're to what they want and what they're looking for in a podcast or a show they're not wrong right that's their preference and that's how it has to be obviously but we've been so clear now i think for so long in terms of what we're doing and what we're building and we keep doing that and we keep being transparent to the fact that like you know i was talking earlier in the show of like yeah three ads in a podcast isn't a big deal and it you know because i remember when it was when we did the first two ads in a podcast that was a conversation as it should be again because like i can't have my cake and eat it too on this where i'm talking about like we're not building this for you we're building this with you and if we're building it with you means that you're going to have your thoughts and your opinions and we're gonna have to have conversations about it and time and time again, I've been shocked in a great way that when we have those conversations, even if the other side doesn't agree, it's usually fine. It's usually like, you know what? I, and I've definitely had them of, listen, that's not what I want, but I'm so glad you guys are doing well. I want to, you know, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go, I'm going to be part of the easy allies community or something, but I'm proud of what you guys have done. And we're like, thank you so much. Like that, that's how it should work. <laughs> right. Of like, I think of, you know, especially when it's we've been around five years now, let alone that I've been doing this 13, you know, talking into microphones about video games. Like, I can't, outside of what, Superman and Ghostbusters, like, what other thing have I consistently watched for 13 years and not been like, ah, my, my opinions have changed, my tastes have changed, I've grown out of it, I've come back to it. Like, that's just how it is. So when you go off to do something like the Dice Awards uh, and, and you know, they, they give you that paycheck and you bring it back and you give it to kind of funny, um, is it also part of, like, building the brand of, like, okay, we're getting kind of funny out there, more people are seeing it, and then we're going to bring back people? Or is it just about, like, funding the company? Oh, no, it's it's both, obviously. It's us wanting to be seen in a certain light or a certain way. Uh, it, it, you know, opportunity to opportunity, I think it varies. You know, Dice, using that as the example, right, starts – uh, specifically because of my Game Awards acceptance speech in 2015. Like, uh, when they... Uh, it would have been 2016, right? They hit me up and were like, hey, we, you know, we're thinking about changing how we do the Dice Awards and who the hosts are. And honestly, we're all inspired by your speech. And it's this idea that we don't need... To, in the same way, I think, you know, you look at uh, voice actors in video games now, right? And the fact that we're able to make our own stars, whether they be uh, Troy Baker or Dave Fenoy. Um it was their idea that like we don't need to pull people from other industries. We have that we have that talent. And we have those spokespeople in our own industry, and so they looked to me and Jess to go do that. And so uh, that was never about like, hey man, we're getting such a great paycheck out of this. <laughs> right. You know, we're gonna retire. That was about like, hey, it's a paid gig, but more importantly, it puts us in front of the other industry luminaries who are probably too busy to watch our four hour long content about Justice League or whatever. Right? Like, it is this idea of getting a check in with those kind of faces and see those kind of people and have them understand, Oh, I know who Greg Miller is. Oh, I know what kind of funny is to, an, to an extent, right? Like I read about it in the back of the dice book while I was waiting for my drink. Like you understand to an extent what that is, let alone. Yeah. The hope is as you know, award shows continue to get bigger and more people want to pay attention, even though they were all pissed about, uh, untitled goose game people in the Twitch chat, see it. And yeah, you convert the, one percent of whoever's watching that hat doesn't subscribe or change their mind right because i understand like me in particular you know there's so many different i guess there's two different sides to greg right where i'm it's me trying to do a serious show whether it be gaming or we have cool friends or something and then there's me i'm going to be a professional wrestler on somebody else's content and so if you don't get professional wrestling and you see me on the gauntlet, take my shirt off and scream at, you know, Barbara Dunkelman from Rooster Teeth about something, you're probably like, this guy sucks. <laughs> but hopefully you then see me in a suit holding it down and talking to somebody you're like, oh, wait, maybe I may, I like this version. What am I missing? And you have that conversation. Yeah, it's the Pepsi challenge, right? Like you're you're a bit too sweet yeah, yeah. Uh, in just short burst. And then, yeah, you got to get around that. And then, oh, yeah, this is this is really good in, in a different context for sure. Yeah. Um. It, we've talked about so many different things that, that, you know, you in particular do, uh, do you feel, um, overstretched? Do you feel busy? <laughs> I guess. I mean, I feel like I know the answer to that, but are you busy, Greg? I'm busy. Yeah. And that's always been a great thing, right? That's what I always joke around about when people ask about it. I was like, you know, it's better to be busy than bored. I'd rather be busy and I'd rather have to turn it down opportunities than people, than me hit other people and be like, Hey, can we, can we, can we talk to somebody about this game? <laughs> can you send us review codes? I'm like, Oh no, we're not gonna send you anything. 
I'm busy, but I'm not overstretched. No, and I think, you know, that's something that ebbs and flows, but I haven't been overstretched in a long time in, in terms of being overwhelmed. Like, we're lucky that we have the team we have here and that we've been able to grow it the way we have, where from the start of the first, you know, employee, it was Kevin, and it was very much like, He'd already been helping us out part time, but then it was like, all right, cool. Now that we're on our own, he really can't because he had a job at IGN as well. But then, you know, we have these conversations, me, Tim, and Nick, and it's just like, what's the pain point? What what can we what do we need right now to make our lives better so we're better at our jobs? Because you know how it is when you run a business. Like you're doing so many things that are not what you want to do, let alone are not what you're good at. <laughs> and so it is about bringing in those right people. So to have Kevin, to have Joey, to have Cool Greg, to have Andy, to have Barrett, have Blessing. Now, like, I am busier than ever. I think, you know, there, on a work week, there is not one work hour that is free. I'm always doing something or have some call or have some other opportunity to do. But, you know, I'm on less shows. I'm on fewer shows. I'm able to sit there and be like, you know, I legitimately can only do two a day at three at three a day. I start falling apart and I can't keep it together by the end of it. But I have a team now that allows that. I have an audience now that understands that, that again, it isn't a big deal. If I skip a kind of funny podcast or if I, you know, have blessing takeover or games daily, I said I was going to do like, they get what's happened. They see the, the proof in the pudding. They see what we're up to. And, and that was the coolest thing about, 2019 was a we called it kind of funny 4.0 where we had started year four but then totally revamped the morning shows and they became you know it went from we were doing the same morning show on twitch and then putting it up on youtube and podcast services every day suddenly we were doing five different morning shows so there was you know every every day of the week had a different show which was a colossal undertaking but gave every show its own vision gave every show its own set of hosts gave every show its own audience, which suddenly meant that, you know, if I skipped the morning show, there would have been a thing. Oh, I, I like it. We like on the morning show, but it, me, I'm never on screencast. No one expects me on screencast. So if I pop up, that's a cool treat. Or you actually are mad that <laughs> you're not getting Joey or Kevin or whatever. <laughs> like that was awesome. And then for this year with games, the same way, you know, we call it kind of funny games 4.0 because it was bringing in bless and it was bringing back PS. I love you. And it was, giving shows identities and regimenting the schedule in a way where it's like, cool, like every hour of the day in that studio is accounted for. So it's hard for me to get in there now just to record VO for a little project I want to do or something like that's great because it gives a schedule and it gives, you know, from the morning what you have to do by the evening. And that's great. I love that. I thrive on that. I, I am very much a, I need a calendar. I need to know what's coming. I need to have a schedule. Otherwise I feel unmoored and I can't do it. So I'm very, very busy, but it's awesome. You do work with a lot of other platforms. You work with Patreon. You work with uh, Twitch, YouTube. Um, d- does it ever feel stressful to like, not necessarily be in full control of your own destiny? Um, rarely. You know, there was a, what, two years ago? Maybe a year and a half ago? I think it was two years ago. Uh, Patreon, out of the blue one day, messaged all everybody. It was like, hey, Great news, uh, audience members. Uh, if, if you didn't know, when you pledge someone a dollar, their take the creator you're paying you're paying is paying your uh, credit card fees. So I, you know, and I'm just pulling these numbers out my butt. But like, you know, it'd be like 15 cents. So really, they've only been getting 75 cents of your dollar. The great news is we're gonna pass that on to you now. You're gonna pay the number up front, and then they'll just get the number, and that'll be great for creators, and that'll be awesome. And everybody lost their freaking mind. Like <laughs> it was insanity and pandemonium. And again, we are incredibly privileged to be who we are and have been on the platform as long as we have and have the audience we do. Where we saw a dip, but it wasn't as bad as the smaller creators. Smaller creators that you know only have a hundred patrons. They suddenly were like, whoa, oh, you know, literally out of the blue, 75% of my revenue is gone. Like, I, they, cause it was this thing that people didn't understand, or the Patreon uh, company, I think, didn't understand, which was like, it's, yeah, 15 cents. Who cares, right? Oh, it, oh, your big pledges is even less than that. So who cares? But it was this idea that so many people had come to the platform now and spread multiple $1 donations out to everybody that suddenly when you take 15%, you know, 15 cents and multiply it by maybe what a hundred Patreons, you know, 50, whatever you want to do, that does become a lot of money. And for a lot of people who are working part-time, they're in school, whatever they have, they have, they have lives, they have other things their money needs to go to. Suddenly that bill that was like already like, eh, 
it's cool. I, I like supporting people to suddenly have it go up whatever percent. They were like, no, I can't do this. I have to, re- you know, put my money in different places. I have to move this around. And so there was panic for a while. And, you know, again, for our size and scope and everything like that, I, I was able to get in front of it and be very clear on Twitter of like, you know, Patreon needs to revoke this or give a, give an option at the very least, right? Of like, when you click on it, do you want to? Do you want to pass this on to them? Do you not want to do it? Like, new pledges should have a different thing, but to just pull that on somebody was a totally different thing. And, and Patreon walked it back, but still, the damage was done. Like, there was a lot of people who didn't get their audiences back, or people who walked away from the platform in general, like, well, I can't trust this platform anymore. And even for us, with our dip, we didn't bounce back from it immediately, right? Like, over time, I think we, we did for sure. But yeah, that was frustrating. Those kind of decisions are frustrating. But then you have it the opposite way where when the adpocalypse came to YouTube, I don't know if you remember this, where oh, yeah. everybody's you know, like legitimately like it was probably day five of it and somebody reached out to us for an interview. And it was that thing where we all looked around like, Tim, is there an adpocalypse right now? And he's like, oh, yeah, it's bad. I'm like, are we in trouble? He's like, no, we make no money off YouTube. Who cares? I was like, oh, okay, great, perfect. Like it's just that diversification. That was our whole thing when we started was – we knew we were starting something different and weird and we didn't want to be out of business because of Patreon suddenly going away. That was that was our other big concern is like, this is great and this is working, but who knows how long that lasts and what that means. And so we always talked about, you know, trying to be like a bar stool with like six different legs where if you sweep one of the legs, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like right. Patreon could go away tomorrow and that would be a huge problem. And we would <laughs> definitely try to find a new subscription <laughs> solution, but the company wouldn't close, you know, tomorrow either. It wouldn't, it, we'd be able to go on. We'd have to change a lot of things. And if YouTube went away tomorrow or stop, you know, monetizing anybody who curses in their videos, that would suck, but we could do it. And if our MCN contract ended tomorrow, like, you know, there's so many different things that would need to happen to actually put us into a real straight state of distress. What are the big cost hurdles that you guys are like trying to overcome as you uh, as you do these fundraisers at the beginning of the year? Like we want to do that and we need to raise the money to do that. Like what are the costs? I mean, for us in San Francisco, right, it's space. Like that's been the, that's the crazy thing about it right now where, you know, we're we moved out of a spare bedroom, uh, you know, in the house I was living at, got our own place here which is a retrofitted apartment that is zoned for business but retrofitted and so it is very clearly like an old it used to be a two-bedroom house and now or you know apartment and now it's been retrofitted there and it's quality of life stuff is what kills us and that's what you know i think can obviously ruin anybody's working thing or uh, experience and so for us to be still in the place that we originally moved here when we were five people but now being nine people and on top of being nine people every day have one of our part-time hosts come in and then it is a thing of well you know a dev's coming in to show a game and it's not just the developer it's their two pr handlers and the the way you go in this office from it being dead quiet and empty to i have people (laughs) this is embarrassing but uh oh there's a lot of people here I, i have to break out the wrestling folding chairs all the fo- all the folding chairs we brought back from WrestleMania and Sur- Survivor Series and SummerSlam with like John Cena's face on the seat. I have to go get those and break them out. We have a couple TV trays we put out for people to eat their lunch off when they're here to collaborate with us. It's like we just run out of space so quickly here. And there's one bathroom, you know what I mean? It's it's a nightmare at times. And so the biggest cost for us has been how what kind of space do we get? How do we ensure that we have enough money to build it out properly? Because you know, like that's obviously something that's huge to us that i want especially for our new employees right who are cool working in this place and it's neat and you know especially you know we hire from the community so people come in and i do think it is like oh man the magic i remember this place and that poster or whatever like i want to give them the experience i had of working at ign where it was like i remember going there and let alone when ign moved downtown in sf and it was like oh man, people planned this office and they painted it and they decorated it. And it's like adults are running the company, (laughs) not me back here with all my Superman Funko pops on my desk. And my desk bumped right up to Joey's with this master chief helmet on it and all these different things. Like the, you know, the big costs are obviously salaries. I think the big costs are uh, space for the company itself. You know, you would think tech stuff, but the tech stuff is such a quick investment on our end where, you what, in 2015, we bought the cameras we're using that are 4K and still great. I know, I think Kevin wants new ones and he'll probably get them, but even whatever. We moved here in 2016 and we bought the video wall and that was great. And now, as you know, we keep designing and planning out the new space. Like, the new space is, you know, knock on wood, going to be the next 10 years of kind of funny. And so it is very much like 
the financing in January was very much of like, cool, let's go big here. Let's push hard here because we want to not write a blank check, but be able to say, what is going to look cool in 10 years still? What is going to still be the best office experience for people in 10 years? Because, you know what, how many more people are we going to hire by, you know, 20, 30? And if so, you know, I want them to come in and have that same experience, not move into the new place and be like, ugh, they thought this is cool. <laughs> All right, Greg, uh, I don't have any other specific questions. Is there anything else, though, that like pops to mind that you think is important? Oh, man. Video games, they're pretty important. They're yeah, the whole, they're, how do you make money off of talking about video games? They're desperately needed. That's my, yep. you know, I, that's all, I, I, I didn't nail it, I don't think, in terms of expressing it necessarily, because it's a weird thing to say. But in my Game Awards speech, one of the things I, the, the heart of that, right, is the fact that it's not fair. It's not fair that, I'm on stage accepting that award and I, it's not fair that I have this audience and that I have this company now and I'm able to make money talking about what other people create, right? Like in, in the speech, I talked about Nicole Tan, who was an environment artist over at Crystal and how, you know, one of the hundreds of names I see at the end of every video game and that's never lost on me. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm always mind boggled when I run in like a dice, when I run into developers and they're like, I've been listening to you for years. Oh my God, when I'm working on a game, we're doing this. And it's just like, I don't, I don't, I wish they were famous. I wish they had these audiences. I wish they could do anything they wanted, right? Like, and I, I know it's not, it's apples and oranges to an extent or whatever, but I, I, I do see the occasional thing of someone who is salty or, you know, just having a bad day. And it is that conversation of just like, man, it's, it's crazy that people are making so much money playing the game I made and I'm just working on other games and doing other things. Like, it's a weird relationship that isn't lost on me. And I hope that people understand that. Yeah, it, it, it's like yeah, we none of this is possible without those games in the first place. Right. So it's like, yeah, you, you got to be grateful. And it, it's tough to put a spotlight on a lot of those people just because the way the industry is built. Uh -huh. uh, and it'd be nice if there was more ways to do that for sure. But uh, yeah, you're right. It's something that's it's easy for a lot of people to forget, but it's important not to for sure. Greg, um, I think I'm going to say thank you now at this point for joining me. No, thanks uh, for having really me. Great man. conversation. Yeah, absolutely, man. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, but for now, let's have everybody uh, tell everybody where they can find you on the internet. You can go to kindoffunny.com. You can go to k i n d a funny.com. It's not a great site, but it'll definitely get you all the Patreons and the YouTubes and the podcasts. And you can just yeah pop kind of funny into your podcasts or whatever you want to do. And I'm uh, I'm Jeff Grubb on Twitter. If you have any questions about the show, any feedback you want to give me, get me there. That's the best way to do it. Um, and then uh, yeah, we're gonna wrap this up. Thank you everybody for listening once again, Greg. Thank you so much. Uh, until next week, everybody have a good one and goodbye.